Hello, good evening, everybody, uh, and welcome to this evening's Facebook Live. My name is Alec. I'm the Managing Director for Wound Care People and the Journal of Community Nursing. Tonight, I'm joined by the wonderful Heidi Sandoz, who's a Tissue Viability Services Lead at Hertfordshire Community NHS Trust, an independent tissue viability consultant for Farita Consultancy Services. Uh, good evening, Heidi. How are you? Hello, Alec. I'm very good. Thank you. Good. Uh, I'm just going to do just a little bit of housekeeping. Uh, first and foremost, however, I'd like to thank uh, our sponsors this evening, which is uh, the Wound Club, which is a, uh, a Smith & Nephew programme. So for Smith & Nephew and Wound Club, thank you very, very much for uh, supporting this event. Uh, the session, as I've said, is best practice in skin tear management. Um, as always, you'll see, or uh, 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 as always, um, there will be plenty of time to ask questions. Um, I've just completely thrown myself by seeing something on the screen there. So I'm going to start again with this bit. I do apologize. So those of you who have watched me before will know that I, no I normally flow through this very easily. Um, so start again. Certificates will be available at the end of the session. Um, there'll be lots and lots of links this evening to various pathways, uh, to various websites, including the Wound Club and various other things. Don't worry too much about noting all of those down or clicking on them as they come up, because you'll be able to get those after the event in uh, in emails and also by watching this back. So there will be quite a lot of things to try and take in. Um, bear with us if we have any technical issues. We're, uh, we're, we're presenting directly from our homes, um, as we've been doing since the start of uh, the pandemic a few years ago. Um, and now it's uh, now it's very much become the norm. So I'm going to hand over to uh, Heidi. Um, do ask as many questions as you possibly can throughout, because we'll be coming back after the presentation for a live Q and A. Um, Heidi, good luck. Uh, I'm going to go and reset my brain, I think, and I'll see you <laughs> after the Q and A uh, or after the presentation for the live Q and A. Thanks, Alec. Thank you very much. And thank you to the Journal of Community Nursing and the Wound Club with Smith & Nephew for asking me to speak on this topic this evening. I'm going to crack on assuming that my slides are being shared. So if they're not, somebody uh, jump in and let me know. So we're going to be talking this evening about um, skin tear management, a topic that I know a lot of you will have been involved with. Uh, in whatever setting you're in, actually, you will have come across them. So what I'm hoping by the end of this session is that we'll do a tiny little bit of a refresher around the anatomy of the skin. So don't freak out. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that. We'll look at some of the changes in the ageing skin. Uh, think about what a skin tear is, what are some of the risk factors for people who might be at risk of developing a skin tear? How can we think about preventing them? How do we classify and manage them when they do happen? Um, and hopefully by the end of all of that, you'll have some understanding of some of those things. I need to see if I can get my slides to move through. So here's uh, an anatomy picture of the skin. We'll start very briefly by reminding ourselves of that. We know that it's made up of two primary layers, the top two layers, the epidermis and the dermis, as you can see in the picture. And then below those layers is a third layer the subcutaneous fat uh, or fat layer, uh, and sometimes that's called the hypodermis. Now, there's several important structures in the skin, as we know. Uh, you'll have sweat glands in there, sebaceous glands, nerve endings, blood vessels, hair follicles, all of which serve a really useful purpose. And I'm not going to be going into the multiple functions of the skin this evening. But one thing I do want to draw your attention to when we're looking at that, I've drawn a little red line around the anatomy picture there, are what are called the REIT edges. And this is the epidermal junction. This is where the epidermis and the dermis come together. And there, if I don't, if you can see my fingers, there, they sort of interlock. Imagine interlocking your fingers like that. And that holds the two together. And the dermis provides the epidermis with the blood supply and the nutrients. That all comes from the dermis. The epidermis doesn't have its own supply there. But as we age, uh, they can start to thin out and separate from each other. So I'm sure you can see in your minds how easily the epidermis and the dermis can separate from each other when those reach edges aren't locking them in. 
and um, there's less collagen in our skin when we're older, less elastin, so it becomes less supple, less resilient. Uh, and deeper in, you'll also get some atrophying of the dermis, less sweat and sebaceous gland activity, which will make the skin drier. And of course, our skin gets damaged by uh, UVA and UVB. And those of you that might be like me, a bit of sun worshipper, then we're putting our skin at risk when we are sitting in the sun and not protecting it very well. Oh, it's going to go through. Don't need to do that. Sorry, let's flip back. So what is a skin tear? Well, we have the International Skin Tear Advisory Panel who have defined a skin tear as a traumatic wound which is caused by mechanical forces. And they're including in that removal of adhesives. So a traumatic wound caused by mechanical forces. The severity of them can vary by depth, uh, but they don't extend uh, through the subcutaneous tissue. So they are an acute wound uh, with a high propensity to develop into chronic wounds, but it's often not the wound itself that leads to that chronicity. Um, it might be that it could be something else that's going on in the person. So somebody who's got a subsequent hematoma and swelling might well readily become a chronic wound as an example, but the factors that lead to the delay in the healing will be the factors that would be associated with that individual themselves or the factors in the area of the body that the skin tears on. Um, and that will be what will create the chronicity if that wound should become chronic. So they're thought of as a co-condition to other conditions and diseases. And whilst they're not exclusive to the older population, when we see them occurring in younger cohorts, then it's likely to be in a neonate or those with a severe illness. They happen as a consequence of something else that's going on, usually. So, of course, some of us will have sustained injuries that fit that definition of a skin tear, trauma caused by mechanical injury. Myself, for instance, I've got a Harry Potter scar on my forehead following a car accident. It was a deep laceration as a result of blunt force trauma with the steering wheel. Now, you could argue, because mine did go through to bone, that it, it wasn't, uh, didn't fit the definition because subcutaneous tissue had been got through as well. And mine was all sutured up and it all healed nicely in seven days. But for me, I didn't have any of the above mentioned problems that, that weren't an issue. It wasn't on my lower leg. Um, it was on my head and I was very young when that happened. So if a skin tear is resulting in increased visits from community staff, then it's because that wound needs care and therefore it's becoming more chronic than a usual skin tear might be. And hospitalisation might be because of other factors or wound infection and sepsis. So whilst we don't fully understand the size of the problem of skin tears, really, uh, largely because we don't have good data around them, documentation around them might not be very good for us to get good data. We can see some of the subsequent issues that they can create. Now, within Hertfordshire and West Essex, within our ICB, we have a tissue viability work stream, which is associated with a frailty work stream. So we're one of five work streams within the frailty work stream. And as we were forming that piece of work and that working group, our local plastics team had been doing some audit and work around understanding their population of admissions that were coming in with pretibial hematomas. And they had realised that this cohort of people that they were getting had a link to frailty, older age and falls. A lot of them were there because they'd fallen. And they also realised that they had a higher mortality rate. So they approached what was then our STP, our Sustainability and Transformation Partnership, um, and they asked if they could do some work around that. And we popped them into our tissue viability work stream and we did a joint piece of work around uh, we were looking at lower limb wounds at the time and so we included this group in there. So of note when you look at these figures that are on this slide are the number of theatre slot cancellations that that particular group experienced with 30% of them being delayed by up to nine days and 42% having uh, one cancellation and 20% having more than one. So this is not helpful when we're starving this population repeatedly for surgery. 
So our plastics team wanted to really look at that. They identified some of the problem. They realized that a lot of them were outliers to their own area. And what they did to uh, speed things up for them, and they, were, they did manage to reduce their mortality rate, was they popped in a theater at a weekend that, was just, that couldn't be canceled, that meant that those people would definitely get seen um, on the weekend, on a Saturday it was. And that helped to change some of those statistics around that. But what it also meant was that we were able to work collaboratively with them on our local pathways in our area. And I'll come back to those. So as I've already said, there are limited incident studies in the literature on skin tears because we have poor diagnosis in practice and prevalence estimates vary. But when you look at some of the literature and, and some of the uh, papers that do talk about them, you can see from this slide there's quite wide variation in the uh, suspected numbers that are out there. So we can suspect that the scale of the problem is significant and, and our aging population of which we cannot deny means the incidence of skin tears is increasing as elderly patients have got a fragile skin and they become at an increased risk. So some of the references that are mentioned there can be found in the uh, reference list at the end of this presentation. So, of course, identifying people at risk of skin tears requires an understanding of the risk factors. Those are the things that can contribute to the risk. And we can think about some of these as intrinsic, so they're from within the person, or extrinsic, from without. And what is listed on these slides here is by no means an exhaustive list. Um, and what we need to consider is what is it about the each factor that actually increases somebody's risk. So, for instance, if we take visual impairment, which was on the previous slide, that in itself does not cause skin tears. But poor visibility might increase somebody's likelihood to fall or bang into things. And that might be what leads to their skin trauma. So, in fact, many of the factors on these two slides are linked to frailty. And we'll come back to frailty on the next slide. So I think you can you can read these in the ISTAP uh, best practice guidance uh, recommendations and, and you can have a look at these in more detail. Um, and they present them very nicely in their document for you to use in clinical practice. So I'm hoping now frailty has become a, a much bigger thing in the NHS and I'm hoping that it's something that you are all aware of. It's not just a term that we're using. And I think we can say that there is a strong correlation to frailty and skin tears, and I'll come back in a moment to a correlation between wounds on the lower limb as well. What you're seeing here on the slide is the Rockwood score. There are other frailty scores, but this is the one that uh, has been chosen to be used in my area where I work. And some of you might be starting to use frailty assessments such as this. Now, I'm not aware of a study, it doesn't mean there's not one out there, but I'm not aware that one has been done linking frailty to skin tears. But if it were, I don't think we'd be surprised to see the majority of people affected falling into those scores there between six, seven and nine. So the moderate and severely frail groups. As I say, within Hearts and West Essex, within our work stream that we had, we focused very much on the lower limb. And our medical director at the time recognised that we didn't know the size of the problem for wounds and cellulitis, lymphedema on our population out there. So she commissioned a public health needs assessment. Now, this is referenced in, in the group and you can read in the reference list. You can go online and read this very big document. We had a public health consultant who undertook it um, and she was just looking at lower limb conditions. So leg ulcers, edema. Uh, foot ulcers and cellulitis really um, and, and what she found was that those people that had those conditions actually had a higher uh, percentage of them with those conditions had a higher frailty score than somebody who doesn't have those conditions. So we've been able to really understand that there's a strong link between lymphedema um, and cellulitis and leg ulcers and frailty. And I think we can all appreciate the link between lymphedema and the risk of a skin tear, for instance, and how should somebody, if they develop a skin tear, how that might become a leg ulcer. And then, of course, all three have got an increased risk of cellulitis. So these, all of these things are very closely knitted together. So it mentions um, 
on the next slide, I think that uh, some of some of the people, 33% of the people that she came across in her study um, were receiving social care. Um, so why is that relevant, do you think? So she was able to get a lot of her statistics from hospital admission statistics, which is a good place to get data from. Now, we're data poor in community services and primary care, but we can look at our hospital episodes and think of them as being quite data rich, really. So she was able to get information around those conditions, but then she was also able to look back at these people using some primary care information and find out how many of them were receiving social care. Now, that's quite important because social care is an indication of how much help somebody needs with their activities of daily living. And that, as you might remember from the earlier slide, is a risk factor. Also, what I want to draw your attention to here is that 83% of the people that she found had got one, uh, more than one long term condition and 43% had more than three. Quite significant comorbidities going on with with these groups of people that are having lower limb conditions. So skin tears are actually very common on the extremities, but more common on the hand and the arm than they are on the lower leg, but they're common on the leg as well. And if our skin is aged and fragile, and I'm sure you can all picture an aged hand with tissue paper thin skin, that ecchymosis, that bruising, the prominent bones, exactly like the one that's on this slide here. And you're caring for people on a daily basis with skin like that. And any time that we come into contact with them and we're touching them or handling them, we're increasing their risk of getting a skin tear by doing that. And just if they're moving around, even in their own homes or in their own environments, the slightest knock can cause something like that from happening. So we have to be very mindful of the things that cause skin tears so that we can be mindful of what we need to do to prevent them. So, I mean, I'm 57. I don't mind sharing my age with you all. I know I look 21, but I'm 57. And I don't know about you, but I manage to catch my arms on door handles and I walk into furniture and items of furniture all the time. But because my skin at the moment is still fairly robust, I do not end up with anything more than mild bruising, if at all that occurs. But when people are at an increased risk of falling or they need assistance with their activities of daily living, then their risk will go up because these are causes of skin damage. So the image that you can see here is a lady who was in her 70s that I was uh, looking after for the community nurses during COVID when we all kind of changed what we were, how we were working on a daily basis. Now, she'd had abdominal surgery and that's uh, why I was seeing her was for that wound. But I went in one particular day to look at that wound again, to give her her dressing change. And she showed me her arm that she had caught on a key that was sticking out of her back door earlier on that day. But imagine how, if, how you could cause damage if you're helping somebody get dressed. Think about how you're helping somebody put one arm into a top and then the other arm into the top. Think about how you're holding their arms and holding their hands while you're doing that. Think about how they might be resisting sometimes what's happening. It's very easy to see that there's lots of hazards around people with a fragile skin um, and how much they can do for themselves without our help will greatly reduce their risk. So if we can encourage people to do things themselves, that's what we need to be doing. ISTAP also included damage associated with the removal of medical adhesives, so dressings and tape, for instance. So that's also included in there. So thinking about dressings that have a low medical adhesive content, such as those that are silicone backed, can also help reduce um, the risk of damage on removal. So with this in mind, it's helpful to consider who is at risk. And this simple flow chart, which is uh, available for you, the, the reference for the ISTAT recommendations are all the way through this presentation. And you can see that then it might be something you want to think about how you can incorporate that into your daily practice. Because if you can uh, identify those at risk, then you can have a look around their environment, have a think about them, have a think about some prevention strategies that you can put in place. And ISTAP also produced a really helpful guide. Um, now, it'll just take me five minutes to read all the words on this slide. So just give me a moment. Now, I'm only joking. I'm not going to read.
those out to you, but you can easily see that in the document. Um, it's a little tick list. It might be something, again, that you think about putting into your local practice. If you're working in a care home setting, then this might be something really useful to think about. And the more ticks you've got, then the more you can identify what it is you need to do to help reduce their risk. It centres on three factors. So it's thinking about the skin, what you can do to reduce, uh, support their skin to be uh, in a better condition to prevent, thinks about mobility and thinks about general health. So just some of the things on there might be thinking about improving the skin condition by moisturising the skin, preventing trauma by not using adhesives or thinking carefully about the adhesives that you're using, staff caring for people as, as staff you know we shouldn't have long nails we're not there for a fashion show we shouldn't be wearing jewelry we're at work to care for people and we there shouldn't be anything on us that can increase harm for them we must be very mindful of that and also how we're handling them as well if you're in their own home, think about the environment while you're in there. So if you're a community nurse working in the community or a carer going into somebody's home in the community, just have a quick look around. Can you see any knock or trip hazards? Can you see furniture that might need moving if they'll consent to that? Little things like that can help reduce their falls risk. What's on the floor? Is there a carpet? How much clutter is there? Things like that. Optimising a person's health and skin condition can go um, some way to reducing their risk. Also thinking about the type of clothing that they might be wearing. So you might think about things that are easy to put on and take off, as well as things that might protect their skin if they do knock into, a, into furniture. So, you know, if they're a lady who likes to wear skirts, perhaps they might consider wearing trousers. It might just offer them a little bit more protection. You might have developed low, uh, pathways in your local areas that you follow. Um, in Hearts and West Essex, our tissue viability workstream has produced quite a few pathways that work across the whole of our system. So they're not just about nursing or health. They're, they involved everybody. And we have four pathways that are associated with skin tears. So we've got preventative ones and then we've got what to do if you're the first person there or what to do if you're the clinician that you have to refer to what to do ongoing after that. It was a collaborative piece of work that included a multidisciplinary working group. And we have members on that group from Tissue Fibility Plastics, East of England Ambulance Service and Social Care. So lots of people were involved. Um, and these pathways also link to other pathways within our frailty pathway group. So of course, if we've got something in there that says, has the person had a fall, that'll immediately signpost them to the falls pathway. Is it on their lower limb? It'll signpost them to the leg ulcer pathway. So it's very clever that we're able to do that within our system. Now, it's important to recognise that when these acute wounds are chronic, so that is to say that they've become hard to heal wounds, there will be some reason for that. And we need to be thinking about what is it that's going on that means their wound hasn't healed in an expected time frame. And we sometimes think of that as being four weeks, um, along with National Women Care Strategy Programme recommendations. But what I would also point you to is within those recommendations, if a wound is on the lower leg, then we need to consider it a leg ulcer from the outset. And we will then follow their recommendations to see if somebody's suitable for compression very early on rather than waiting. So in Hearts uh, um, and West Essex, as I've said, our, our Path, our pathway also signposts across to those leg ulcer pathways very quickly. Uh, this is just showing you what our pathways look like. They're, they're made in something called Visio, uh, so they um, you can click on them and it can take you through to guidance. So within here, for instance, we've also got the pictures of the classification of, of, of the uh, skin tears that people can look at as well. So we haven't managed to prevent one. A skin tear has happened and we need to think about how we're going to manage that. So essentially, when you're thinking about this, you'll be thinking about assessment. And, and that is the cornerstone of excellent wound care always. And it's quite often the thing that isn't done. And we're missing a trick if we're not fully assessing a wound. We're missing an opportunity to diagnose that wound correctly so that we can put in place the right treatment plan. So at the very start with a skin tear as a traumatic injury, 
there might be a need to determine whether it's something you can deal with at the beginning. If you're the first responder that's come across this injury, then you might be thinking, can I manage this or do I need to escalate it to somebody else? And that assessment will be more about that when you first go in than anything else. We need to correctly identify them on presentation, fully document. So think about how your documentation is set up to support that um, and then setting appropriate treatment goals to optimise our management. It might also be that they we need to be thinking about referring on to other services so that we can support the wound itself or any other line under other line underlying causes. I've got Alison's teeth in tonight. Assessment requirements will, of course, differ according to where in the skin tear journey you're coming in at. So if you are present at or close to the time of injury, then your assessment will be about is there immediate danger? Is there bleeding that I need to control? Have they had a fall and cannot get up? Are they conscious and breathing? Is anything broken? Once emergency requirements are established, then you're going to be thinking about calling 999. Um, and if emergency assistance isn't required, then it might be that you're thinking about first aid. And, and if you're in a, a care home setting, you should have first aiders on site. The injury might be an obvious wound, but there might be other injuries that you need to consider um, and you will need to bring bleeding under control. Where, life, where threat to life is not present, um, and in some areas now, and certainly in our area, we've got responses that are driving to prevent hospital admissions. So, and actually to support our ambulance uh, teams as well. Uh, so it might be that an early intervention vehicle, or you might have it called something different in your area, is sent to pick somebody up off the floor and manage any initial injuries. Or it might be a community nursing team that are called and asked to go in with a quick response time, for instance. And in our area, our community nursing teams are also supporting ambulance response times. Um, so it's it's whilst it's great for the patients that all this is going on, it's adding it does add layers uh, of difficulty for our staff who are having to find ways of meeting these needs to uh, support the ambulance service so that the wait time for ambulance can come down and also to prevent admissions. If they're in uh, the injured person's in a residential home where training has been given to manage skin tears in that home and they can manage them independently, then they may well be able to do that. Or they might choose to refer on to community nurses after they've done their initial first aid. And in some areas, not in mine yet, but in some areas, we're aware that residential homes have got what are called skin tear boxes on site. So they've got everything they need on site to be able to manage the injuries when they do happen. So back to that skin tear then, um, whether there's a threat to life or not, you will probably have to control bleeding. Uh, very often these people have got very fragile skin. They might have been on steroids for a long time. They may be on anticoagulants, in which case there will be a lot of blood. Um, and that can look quite terrifying. Um, and very often it's not as terrifying as it actually looks. So uh, applying pressure, elevating the area, if it's a limb and you can elevate it, that can all help to curb that bleeding. Cleansing the wound, cleaning out any hematoma or debris, that can help clarify the severity of the damage and then will also enable classification. This is the classification that ISTAP have put into their document and correctly identifying skin tears on presentation and then fully documenting them um, can help us set out our treatment goals and optimise management. So ISTAP, as I say, have, have popped this classification into their best practice document. Um, and in 2020, following a, a reliability and validity testing study, which they carried out across 44 countries, they added in a definition for a flap to the classification tool just to remove confusion. So you can see that in italics at the bottom there, because some people were thinking when we, we're talking about a flap, they were thinking of flaps as in plastic surgery. So this tool provides three types of skin tear. Uh, you've got type one where the tear is linear or a flap, and that can be repositioned to cover the wound bed. Type two, you'll have some partial loss where you can't fully reposition it to cover that wound bed that's exposed. And type three where flap loss exposes the whole of the wound bed. 
So once you've classified and cleansed, you can approximate, that's the word we like to use, approximate the flap back across the wound. So you can see this is my lady who caught her arm on the key in the door. Now, there's a few ways you can do this. You can do it with a gloved finger. It might dampen the finger. It might help. Or you might want a bit of tackiness. You don't want too much tackiness because it's a very fragile piece of skin and it can easily tear. Dampened cotton tip, dampened gauze, tweezers, very careful with those, or even a strip of silicone. When I say that, I'm not talking about the adhesive strips that used to be used to close a skin tear. And then you will cover it with an appropriate dressing. Now, there's a variety of dressing types on the market that you can use and which is chosen will very much depend on your local formula. So I'm not here to promote any particular product over another. You may well have a pathway as well that guides you to different products at different times in the pathway. But some of the common choices that we might use are silicon foam dressings and acrylic dressing, hydrogel sheet dressings. Um, it really depends on your area and your formula as to what you'll have available. Whichever dressing you are applying, pay attention to which way you apply it to the wound. So once you've rolled the skin flap back across the exposed wound area, then you will want to apply the dressing in the direction of that flap. So if you're applying the flap this way, you put the dressing on this way as well. So you want it because if you if you put it on this way, you might knock the flap back or roll it back and it won't be approximated over the wound as nicely. Once the dressing's in place, you can uh, draw an arrow onto the dressing and sometimes in some areas they might even put the date on as well, indicating uh, and make sure you know which it is the date for removal or the date it was applied. Um, so uh, make sure you are consistent with what you're doing in your area about that. And then when it comes to taking the dressing off, uh, and it will very much depend on what goes on with that wound, uh, whether it becomes a very wet wound and the dressing needs changing sooner, or whether it's a dressing that's designed to stay on um, for anything from between seven to 14 days, depending on the manufacturer. When you come to take it off, take it off following that arrow that's drawn on the back. So you'll be taking it off pretty much in the same direction you put it on. But it might not have been you that put it on. It might not have been you that saw the initial injury and you don't know which way the flap is underneath there. That's why it's really important to communicate by drawing on the back in which direction the dressing needs to be removed. Do so with care. Do it slowly. You might even want to use medical adhesive removers um, in some instances, particularly when the dressing is not a silicone dressing. <clears throat> Just to signpost you back here again, because it, just to remind you, if this wound is on the lower limb, then think of it as a leg ulcer and follow the lower limb recommendations from the National Wound Care Strategy um, immediately. So I've shown you the pathways that we've uh, developed in our area. Uh, they were quite elaborate looking. They might look a bit confusing as well. But often what we do is we then take those pathways and turn them into something that looks a little bit simpler. So East of England Ambulance Service, the pathway that you're looking at on the right there, they produced a much simpler guide for their staff who were working out in um, emergency services in their ambulances for them to follow. And then on the left, there's one that Smith and Nephew have produced. If you haven't got a pathway in your area and you happen to use their dressings, that might be something you're interested to look at. So let's go back to my, my lady. Um, I was able to roll the flap that she had over her wound. But as you can see, it didn't fully cover the wound bed. So that was classified as a type two with partial flap loss. Um, I was able to pop a dressing on that she had on for two weeks. The dressing I used for her was actually supposed to stay on for three weeks, but she uh, I, she wanted it off at a week. I managed to convince her to keep it on for two. That was the compromise. And we took it off at two weeks. And you can see that the wound had largely healed. She's just got one very small area left. And perhaps if we'd kept it on for three weeks, that may well have healed as well. 
You can also see, though, how dry her skin is, how fragile it looks, how dehydrated that is. So, you know, we had some conversations about we don't want this to happen again. So I, I got her some emollients prescribed so that she could be looking after her skin a bit better. Talk to her about her fluid intake. Um, not not talking alcohol there, just general fluids that are non-alcoholic, up in her water intake, just so that she could give uh, a little bit more care to her skin. And of course, the cause of this injury was a key in the back door. So we looked at that with her husband and I was like, does it have to stay in there all the time? You can see how you can easily bang your arm on there or catch your clothes on it. So he decided that he would put a little hook and the key was always hanging on the hook and not left in the door. So she couldn't do something like that again. So it's not just about when somebody sustains a skin tear, it's not just about going, OK, let's look at the wound. It's also about thinking, well, how, how exactly did that happen? So they tripped over a rug and bang their arm onto the furniture. Um, we often protect small children around our homes by putting little bumper things that you can buy on the corner of furniture. Perhaps you need to think about doing something like that as well. So knocking their arm against a sharp corner of furniture, maybe something like that would just help reduce the risk too. Of course, if the wound isn't responding to treatment and not progressing towards healing, then we might need to press reset and carry out a another full holistic wound assessment consider what's going on in that person that might be delaying their healing if the wound is on the lower leg as i've repeatedly said then maybe a vascular assessment um, and compression if indicated so when i say vascular whilst we might think about referring to vascular i don't mean they have to do the assessment i mean that you would probably get a nurse who would consider uh, their arterial status in their lower limb what else is going on in that individual that might be delaying healing? Might be that we need to think about nutrition, but it could be linked to medication or underlying conditions and so on. Is it the wound bed itself that's the problem? Do we need to look at the wound and think about what's going on there? And that's where wound bed preparation and consideration of infection or biofilm and the wound bed tissue can help us make a decision around what we might need to do there. I'm just touching on some of these things. Um, we don't have time to go into wound assessment and uh, it, on the wound club, for instance, that Smith and Nephew do, there is a, a presentation that you can go and have a look at there about wound assessment if that's not something you're familiar with. So preventing another, as I've repeatedly mentioned as we've gone through this, is about going back to that risk reduction checklist that I showed you earlier, reviewing the cause of the skin trauma, considering how the factors associated with that can be reduced. A sharp edge to a piece of furniture, for instance, as I've already mentioned, what can we do to remove those hazards? We're constantly thinking about focusing on skin mobility and general health. And we're not just patching up the wound as we've gone in. Oh, let's stick a dressing on that and not think about why it might have happened. We might need to link into lots of other teams. There's a whole multidisciplinary team that we can uh, plug into out there. And considering who else needs to be involved in preventing these injuries again needs to happen throughout this journey. Depending on the severity of the journey at the outset, and I'm thinking here about a fall where maybe there was another injury, such as a fracture, or where they might have needed plastics to be involved or hospital admission, um, then there might be uh, more access to a wider group of teams there. Consider the frailty team if you have one in your area, and the frailty team will link into and include physio, occupational therapist, pharmacists, a doctor, nurses and a full holistic assessment can be undertaken. Referral to the falls team if they fell, for instance, and we might need to think about what additional support do they need in uh, with social care. Um, and we might need to review that home environment. So let's think about family and friends as well. So last few slides to summarise, uh, skin tears are acute wounds, uh, but they have the and they have the potential to be closed by primary intention. And you can see from my lady's example there that she healed pretty well. Uh, traditionally, when we're closing wounds by primary intention, we might be using things like sutures or staples or adhesive strips. But in the uh, fragile, frail skin of the people that we're looking after, those are generally uh, not suitable options 
and we no longer recommend the use of adhesive strips to close over skin tears. Um, so if that is something that you're doing, then I would strongly recommend you go and have a look at the ISTAP recommendations and rethink your practice around that. So suitable dressings uh, will be a dressing that might initially think about controlling the bleeding, but definitely you want to be picking something that's easy to apply and remove. It's not going to cause trauma on removal. Um, it will be flexible. It will be able to mold or contour to the different parts of the body that, that they're on. You want something that's going to be cost effective and therefore can also stay on for a long period of time. You don't really want to be thinking about doing a daily dressing. You want to try and leave these wounds alone for as long as possible, really. And now it will depend on which dressing you're using in your area as to how long that is. But if you can get them to the maximum wear time, whether that's five, seven days or more. So thinking about some tips in practice that we've mentioned as we've gone through this presentation, marking the dressing with an arrow to indicate the correct direction of removal. Think about using adhesive removers to minimise trauma on removal and take time to remove dressings slowly. You might want to think about adding a skin barrier product onto the skin around because that can also help protect skin on removal using emollients to prevent skin damage, to rehydrate dry skin and protect them in the future. And then continuing to monitor the wound once it's occurred for changes and signs of infection. So keeping up with that assessment. <clears throat> but what I don't want you doing, unless there's another reason to, is just peeling the dressings back every day, just have a little look, see what's going on. If nothing's changing, if it's looking all fine and hunky-dory, leave well alone. So we've covered what a skin tear is, we've had to think about the risk factors and the causes, and we've had a chat about how to prevent them, how to treat them, and how we can reduce another occurrence when one does happen. But what are we waiting for? Do you know anybody who's at risk now? Your relatives, your friends, you? I mean, we're probably all going to be at risk at some point in our future, so we can all start right now to reduce our risk and many other risks that we might have with our health actually we can start by getting active i don't know if any of you have ever seen that the videos on youtube of that german female gymnast she fascinates me she's over 90 and she's leaping over horse things and boxes and somersaulting absolutely amazing um i can barely get up off the floor uh, properly. So it's fascinating to see people like that and realise what our, all of our potential is to keep fit. Drinking more water, we should be drinking one and a half to two litres a day, we're advised. Eating well, good, well-balanced diet. And those are just three starting places for all of us to be thinking about improving our quality of life later on. So thank you for listening. I'll just end on the reference slide, but I'm sure you'll be able to go back to that. Um, and that's the end of my talk. And I, I think I'm going to hand back to Alec now. Thank you. Thank you, Heidi. That was um, a really interesting, uh, a, a very interesting presentation. I know that from uh, from following the comments through, we've had over um, 800 people watching this evening live. So Ooh. as you can imagine, there are, I didn't uh, know that there the are a number of... Uh, well, I, I thought at the start, I'm, I'm, not, I'm definitely not going to tell you how many people are probably going to watch this because <laughs> it's a really interesting subject. Um, from a personal point of view, I, I find it really, really interesting when you were talking about the uh, how, how skin ages. And I've seen this sort of stuff before. But I'm, uh, I'm, I'm dyspraxic. So I can't walk in a straight line. I walk in, even through doorways. I walk, I think, on a straight line, and I end up going on a diagonal. So I rip shirt sleeves off and trouser pockets oh, and things like that. I do it constantly, yeah. and I've constantly got bruises. And while listening to you, I was thinking, so how am I going to manage that when I'm older then? And I'm more at risk of, uh, yeah. of, of, of skin tests because currently I can deal with a bruise. Half the time, I don't even know that I've got them because I've walked into something. But surely that must be, you know, there, there must be people who are more at risk of that sort of thing, whether they are dyspraxic or, um, well, dyspraxic specifically, sure. because that's something that I deal yeah. with day to day. Yeah, for sure. And I think the first thing to be aware of there is you're, you've identified that risk in yourself. Uh, now so you might start thinking about 
it, when that risk becomes a bigger risk because your skin is is less able to protect itself when you get older how you can think about how your furniture is in the house not having too much furniture around for instance uh, where there is furniture that you're wandering into what can you do with that furniture to soften those edges so that you're not likely to tear your skin so readily so i think it's things like that also thinking about clothing um a bit harder in the summer when we tend to take layers off we don't want layers on in the summer but it might be that you have to think about layers that can cover protect your skin um so we're quite fortunate now aren't we with fabrics where we've got fabrics that we can use that are more breathable yeah fabrics that like bamboo for instance can keep you cool in the summer and keep you warm in the winter so fabrics like that might be useful with long sleeves when you're indoors brilliant um yeah, yeah so that's just purely me on a personal level I'll think about that in a few yeah. years time yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but we we've got so many questions from the audience as you can imagine I'm going to crack on with those if you don't mind Heidi um, we're mm. going to try and uh, whiz through as many of them as as we can for those of you watching at home as always um, we, we we won't have enough time to get through all of the questions this evening however do keep them coming through because what we do uh, uh, as we do after every one of these events is a copy of this video goes onto our website alongside um, a full list of all the questions that have been asked with with written answers that you can download. Um, I have seen a few people comment on um, the size of some of the text on the screen because one or two of the slides did have quite a lot of information on them, in particular where we were showing pathways and things like that. And some of you no doubt will be watching this on mobile phones and iPads and other devices. Don't worry. Um, all of the slides you'll be able to download from our website, I think, from tomorrow afternoon. So if there's any specific things that you're looking to, um, you know, that you're looking to uh, uh, to, uh, to, to, to relook at um, from the slides here, then you can absolutely go back and do that tomorrow. So uh, but for now, we're going to get straight on to the questions. Number one, do you have any tips for implementing pathways like ISTAP and how important is it to follow a specific pathway? So that's quite a big question, isn't it? Um, tips on yes. implementing pathways. I think uh, you're talking about quality improvement project there, really. So there's lots of things to consider. Start with your stakeholders. Um, if you just come up with a pathway and chuck it out there, people won't buy into it necessarily unless they've been involved in the journey along the way. Um, so and sometimes expect that journey to take a little bit of time uh, because you need to get the right people involved especially on a pathway like that, where there's multiple services that are going to be caring for these people. So start with your stakeholders, get buy-in from everybody, bring the evidence to the table with those stakeholders, and then you can start designing and building your own and thinking about how that suits uh, the local area. What was the second part of that question? Well, how, how important is it um, to follow a pathway? OK, so I think where pathways are most useful is where you can build consistency across an area. Uh, so with the ICBs now, that gives us a really good opportunity to make sure we've got equitable access to care. So wherever somebody is in our ICB, we know that the staff within that system, be they in social care, in residential care, in community health care, primary care or ambulance care, just a few examples, um, are yeah. all following the same pathways using the same products that just makes education uh, simpler. Um, if we're doing that as well. So I think that's where pathways come onto their own, really. They they remove inequitable care, they provide consistency, and it's very useful for education. But it's also, I, I guess, um, you know, it, it's you, you, nurses are dealing with so many different things. We're talking about one very specific condition in, in, uh, in skin tears today. And there were just some things that you mentioned earlier, which I thought, actually, they're really good tips. And actually, one or two of them I, I, I've, I've heard in the past and probably just forgotten about because I'm not a clinician dealing with skin tears. Things such as the direction that you apply the dressing using arrows and things like that to remind you which ways to peel it off dates and I, I quite like the fact that you pointed out remember whether it's the date that you put it on versus the date that you that you take mm. it off and things like that in pathways are just really good to make it very clear um I did see in the in in the comments that um somebody said that they were in Norfolk I think that have their own pathway um we talked about the ESTAP pathway Smith and nephew have a pathway we're going to be showing a link to that so that you can get access to that later so do take a look at those um, another, the, the next question, um, and this is another thing that I've seen come up 
there are so many comments on this that I think we've had to just choose a, a, just one, and it's to do with steri strips. And so this one is why are steri strips no longer recommended for skin tears? So I think the reason why the ISTAP uh, expert board felt they were a problem was that they can in themselves cause trauma on removal. Um, and because they're quite sticky, uh, what was happening was in some places, if they're not removed with care, if you, it's hard to draw the arrow on them. So it's sometimes not that clear which way to take them off. Um, and that can actually lead to further trauma. And I think their stance is that there are better products on the market now that you could use that will lessen that likelihood of causing harm on dressing removal. Okay, brilliant. Um, question number three, can we use compression on lower limb skin tears? Yes, if it's safe to do so. So you, you need to do some kind of assessment before you apply compression. Uh, now, uh, National Wound Care Strategy Programme have introduced immediate and necessary care, which is where we can do a red flag assessment. So highlight if there's any red flags there that mean compression isn't suitable and we can put them in mild compression very early on. So if you're looking at a lower limb that's got some, particularly if it's got some edema, um, you might want to get them into compression as soon as. That's certainly something that we've put in our pathways in our area. Um, and then at two weeks, you, their guidance is that then you can think about doing your full assessment with that, thinking about the vascular assessment in the lower limb, ABPI, and then get them into full compression at that point, if safe to do so. OK, uh, the next one is um, I don't know if, I, if this is a, a question for me or for, or for you. Um, what is in the skin care box? Is it like first aid? So, no, uh, well, I have, we don't have them in my area. So somebody else who uses this in their area, you mentioned Norfolk have a pathway. They might have skin care boxes. They might like to write that in the chat. But I think when, when we're thinking about introducing them in our area, we'll probably have something in there that can help with that first aid and controlling the bleeding for the, the residential homes, but then we'll also have our recommended dressing that they can put on and mark which way they put it on, whilst they will then probably, they'll be referring to a, a, a community nurse to come in the next day, for instance, um, unless we've managed right. to get them trained. It's our plan in our area to train uh, different levels of, of tiers of staff, if we're calling them tiers, to be able to do things at different um, levels. So, I, so if the person is asking specifically for the uh, Smith and Nephew skin tear box, and I've seen this, and they've usually got uh, variations of the Aleve and Gentle soft silicone um, dressings, the pathway, various other bits and bobs, and we're going to be having some links to those at the end. So perhaps um, the person who's asked that question, I do apologise, I don't have your name. We can uh, uh, keep an eye out for the link at the uh, at the end. Um, something in there to clean the wound as well. Sorry, I didn't mention that. There'll probably be something in there to clean the wound. Yeah. Yeah. So the next one is, uh, can carers in residential homes use a skin care box and apply dressings? So in areas where they've got those, they, they will and should have had training to do that. So, yes, if they've been trained to do so. And to go back to the first point, that's the, I guess, part of the whole reason that we have pathways, right? So that mm -hmm. uh, it makes it easy for anybody within a trust uh, situation to be able to, uh, to, to provide the same level of care. Yeah. Um, OK, next question. Let's have a look. Are there any tips on best management of wounds, such as pre-tibial lacerations with deeper concerns? Depends what those deeper concerns are. <laughs> I don't know whether they've been a deeper laceration. Yeah. Do, 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 so, do you, sorry, I was just, do you want to skip that? And we'll maybe that we can come back to that when we can. Yes, I want to. Clarify the question a little bit more, yeah. Yeah, yeah, That'd yeah. If maybe the person who's asked that question, so it's, are there any tips on best management of uh, of of wounds such as pre-tibial lacerations with deeper concerns? If you can just clarify what you mean by that, then we'll come back to you in the uh, in the Q and A and host that onto the website. Um, another thing that uh, I notice quite a lot of questions about are, are hematomas, and so the next question is, uh, how do you remove a hematoma? And what is the size of a hematoma that is safe to remove? Yeah, it depends where it is on the body, um, how big it is. So in our, our plastics team, this is where their work came in, really, was with the pre-tibial hematomas that they were getting. So in our pathways, we've got a clear picture uh, of 
we use the ISTAP classification, but then we've got a more advanced classification in our in our fourth pathway, and we are signposting to plastics for those. Um, now, it might be that you've got a system in place where you can do a virtual consultation with plastics. You could send a picture, give them some history, uh, give them that information, and they might say that uh, they want to bring that person in um, to operate. So that's how we've got it set up in our area that we, we might look to do that. Now, if they're not going to be operated on um, or they're not fit for surgery, then there are things that you can use to clean that hematoma out. Uh, you can use maggots, very good. They love a good hematoma and they'll clear it out really, yeah. really nicely with very low risk of bleeding, actually. Uh, so you do want to make sure that that bleed has stopped, but um, maggots are cracking good little creatures for doing that. And then, of course, there's a variety of other debridement products that you can you can think about using that can soften that hematoma up because they often harden up quite quickly um, and that'll start breaking it down and clearing it out as well. You'll then yeah, be left and, with a big, uh, a big, a fairly big wound. They're more common on the lower limb, the hematomas, and um, and then you'll be, you'll also be thinking about: is this somebody I can get into compression? Uh, and I'm from Cardiff, and maggots, uh, the, the the maggot Ooh, factory yes. is just up the road Home, in Bridgend. So it's, Home uh, turf, it's yeah, 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 not too far away. Um, so somebody just has, has has asked if we can just clarify the uh, the steri strips question, which is: uh, can can um, can you confirm if steri strips are not to be used? Our local A and E continues to use them on skin, on skin tears. So the advice uh, from the best practice recommendations, which was an international expert panel, is that they are not to be used on skin tears. And if you've got a deeper laceration going through uh, more through to the, the subcutaneous tissue, then that's a deeper wound and sometimes glue and uh, steri strips might get used in those cases. But if you've and they might even have to suture some of those, of course. Um, but if it's just a skin tear, as the classification is that we've seen, the advice is that they're not to be used. Uh, just, uh, just so that I can clarify that, then, because um, I think what they're asking is, uh, you know, it, it's we don't want that person to go back and say to their if they work in A and E. By the way, I'm not entirely sure where that person works. If you, you, you know, to go back to the to whoever in in A and E and say you shouldn't be doing this. It, the best practice statements are are simply that they're recommendations, right, rather yeah, than sort they're, of they're, NHS they're guidance not... as to what you have to do. Exactly. Yeah, we have we don't have nice guidance on something like this that's looked at evidence and put that evidence into a must and or should or consider kind of a guidance that nice tend to do. They are recommendations. And the best way to tackle something like that, which is what we did with our ambulance service, was to have this multidisciplinary stakeholder group working on something together. And that moved our ambulance service away from using them. Okay. Yeah, yeah so I think that makes sense. Tricky. I think that makes sense. Um, the other thing, actually, going, back, going back to steri strips, just thinking about yeah. my lady and, and the picture, you can see how with her wound, because hers was a type two and we couldn't approximate it to cover the whole of the wound. You can see how you'd have a gap in the wound there with steri strips where they'd be covering, they'd be on, on the damaged skin, on the skin on the other side of the wound, but they'd also be overlying the wound as well. And I think you can see how that's not suitable. Yeah, I think it's um, it's really interesting how many people have actually made comments around steri strips and how yeah. commonly they are clearly yeah. still used. Yeah, no. um, you know, in 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 multiple settings. So uh, yeah. this just highlights really the fact that you know a, a session like this evening on on sort yeah. of what is what should be best practice um, is is needed. Um, okay, so we've got a couple more, and we've got maybe a minute, two minutes left. Um, because I'm sure that most of our viewers want to go and finish their desserts that they didn't finish last night on Valentine's night or whatever else yeah. they want to do at 830. But uh, let's just yeah. see if we can get through one or two more questions. Um, can you use a can you use a dressing with adhesive across the whole dressing to manage skin tears? So, yes, you can. I mean, the acrylic dressing that I use is like that. Um, 
and over time it loses that adhesiveness where the wound is so it comes off quite easily silicone back dressings as well the silicone back phones it's a different kind of adhesive to if you're thinking about something like a hydrocolloid for instance where it's a very very adhesive dressing so something using a silicone back phone whilst it is tacky all the way across it's a different kind of stickiness so you can but be very careful about the choice of dressing that you're using and make sure that it's a dressing that's suitable for skin tears. Okay. Um, I'm, uh, I, I'm, I'm really sorry, but we, we, we've run out of time and there are so many questions left. I, I do apologize to anybody who's watching at home that we haven't got to your question, in particular if we missed it because I was talking about my dyspraxia and how it was going to affect me when I'm older, but it was just a very interesting <laughs> point. Um, I'll, we're going to take all of these questions. We're going to share them with uh, with Wound Club and Heidi and other specialists. We're going to get answers to those, put them along uh, alongside the presentation that you can view, um, both download the slides and view this video and have a look at the Q and A on our website. Um, that'll be a, it'll take us a bit of time to get the uh, the Q and A done, but rest assured we will get that done for you. Um, the link to certificates should be available uh, on the screen now. Um, I'd just like to thank again to the whole team over at Wound Club and Smith and Nephew. I know that you've uh, you've worked hard on this, but a, a special thank you to Heidi because Heidi's put this presentation together, and um, I know that uh, you know these things take quite a lot of time, and they can make people uh, or you can be quite nervous, as you as demonstrated by me at the start of this presentation when delivering things live, things do go slightly wrong and you can be slightly distracted. So Heidi, thank you so much for the amount of effort that you put into this evening. And uh, it's, uh, certainly I've learned a lot and I, I've taken quite a lot um, away from it. Um, from a from a Smith and Nephew and Wound Club point of view, there are a few slides that we're just going to show now with just some resources that they've got available. Um, they are going to be available, uh, as I said, during the presentation. So I'm just going to skip past them. But there there are there's so much support that Smith and Nephew have available. They've got various pathways, training materials. We've talked a few times around a skin tear box. You can contact those using their contact details, which will be available. Um, if you want to either speak to a rep, speak to somebody from Smith and Nephew or get your hands on one of those skin tear boxes to see what they are. Um, there are a, a number of resources. We're going to put links to all of those things onto the uh, onto the website. Um, do download your certificate. One final thing. In two weeks time, two weeks today in Milton Keynes, that's the first and the second of March. We're back for wound care today. It's a completely free to attend conference that's taking place at the Arena MK in Milton Keynes. If you haven't already registered, it's not too late to do so. You can come for one or two days. We've got a completely independent program um, that's been put together by the wonderful uh, uh, Helen Shoker, who's our new clinical director. So do come and join us for that. Come and say hello to myself and, uh, and my team when you're there. Look out on our Facebook pages for any future events and uh, enjoy your evening. Uh, belated happy Valentine's Day to everybody. I feel like as though that's something we should say, right? Helen, hi, uh, Heidi, that's about right. Ha happy Valentine's Day to everybody. Yeah, yeah. lots Brilliant. of love. Okay. Yeah. Lots of love. Uh, have a good evening. We look forward to seeing you all soon. Thank you very much and goodbye. Thanks, Alec. Thank you.